Yeah, so we're carrying on talking about friendship this morning, and and it's kind of a pliable term, isn't it? Like, it, it can mean a lot of things, especially in English. You know, we, we have one word that covers a lot of different relationships, and we all call them friends, right? Like, like your dog can be your best friend somehow. Um, we commonly talk about, you know, dogs being man's best friend, but but like... You know, you can develop a friendship with a college prof as well. Or you might have a book that you love and you call that your friend. Like there's, you know, an author you've never met. That can be your, they can be your friend too, right? And so it's a really, it's a broad term. And so sometimes we have to qualify it a little bit. And one time that happened for me in my life. Um, I was at, was I was at college. I was 18 years old and, um, and I met this girl my first week on campus. And we, we uh, were immediately friends. You know, we spent, started spending time together, hanging out. And we'd known each other for exactly one month when a guy came up to me. I remember it was like a Saturday. And he came up to me. He says, um, are you, do you like Tabitha? Like, are you guys going to, are you dating now or something? I was like, no. Um, He's like, oh, well, okay. Well, I was, I was thinking about, you know, maybe pursuing her and see if, you know, something happens there. I was like, yeah, all the power to you. Go, go for it. And then I wasn't quite sitting easy with that conversation <laughs> afterwards. It's like, well, that, that kind of feels like a risk for some reason all of a sudden. And I knew, I knew at that point I'd been inducted into something that we had a term for at Bible school. Tabitha and I were special friends. Now, if you need a better definition for special, yeah, you need a better definition for that. I can't give you one. It's somewhere, it's somewhere between we're friends and we're dating. And it's kind of this nebulous terrain that uh, we existed in for about 13 months after, 15 months after that. Um, took me a while to, well, we had to get to know each other a little bit, and, and I had to kind of get my brain sorted out. If you don't know already, I'm an idiot. So that was part of the, the process. Uh, and then there was just the simple working up the nerve as well, right? So yeah, 15 months later, you know, middle of winter, and uh, what better time to, to start a dating relationship at Bible school. But as soon as I asked her, then we were into a different phase of friendship. You know, as soon as I said, hey, do you, would you like to go out? That lo- led to a very awkward conversation that evening, but we weathered that as well. And then nothing was the same after that. It was kind of to a new place. It was all of a sudden a very unique relationship. And I would say to this day, we are still best of friends. Despite getting Fly, our puppy last year, I think I am still my wife's best friend. I think I can say that confidently, and she mine. But it's a unique kind of relationship. And 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 yeah, I could say, okay, we're, I'm friends with Tabitha, and I can say I'm friends with my college roommates still, you know, that other college roommate. We were roommates in college as well uh, after we got married for a year. But it, it kind of leads you to a, a unique place, obviously. And, and this morning, I wanted to take a second stab at being friends with God um, and particularly look at the person of Jesus Christ. We looked last week at the friendship that develops between Abraham and God. This week, I, wanted, I want us to look at being friends with Jesus. And, and being friends with Jesus, Jesus offers us a very unique kind of friendship. So I said before, you know, being a friend can mean a lot of different things. And especially with Jesus, Jesus has some very particular things in mind when we talk about being his friend. And so if you've got your Bible uh, this morning, you can flip over to John chapter 15. Now, We kind of realize that even beginning with Abraham, um, God, there's this capacity for us to be friends with God. And last week we talked about how that, that doesn't just mean a regular sort of friendship like we would have maybe with a classmate growing up or somebody next door, but being friends with God is kind of unique. And Jesus really encapsulates that well for us. But there is sort of a turning point uh, in that relationship, just as Tabitha and I had a, uh, a turning point in our relationship that f- fateful January evening, 
Uh, there's a turning point in our relationship with Jesus as well, and it comes in John chapter 15. So I'm going to read verses 9 to 17 and see if you can catch it as well. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he's describing the relationship that they're to have with him and that he has with the Father. And he puts it this way. He says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands, and remain in his love. I've told you this, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my father's, in the name of my father, sorry, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command, love each other. So the first thing we notice, and this came up last week as well, is that Jesus initiates friendship with us. It's not the other way around. Jesus is the one that lets us in, as it were. Uh, verse 15 says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you, fr my, I've called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. So we talked about this last week, that, that one of the key things in friendship with God, what it means to be God's friend, is that God discloses himself to us. He, he reveals himself to us. We can't go searching it out. The hidden things of God are, are still hidden, whether we want it that way or not. We have to get into a position where God is willing to create some self-disclosure. You know, growing up, I think especially, I, I heard a lot of sermons, and I don't know if they all had to do with the parable of the talents that Jesus tells, but it, it always seemed to end up that it was like, if you could just apply this passage in your life, then God would say, just as he does to the servant in the, in the parable of the talents, well done, good and faithful servant. You've served me in this little thing, now um, you can serve me in much. And I think that's a wonderful, those are, those are, I hear those words spoken, and, and I, I love hearing them even at funerals as people speak that over, look over the sort of compass of somebody's life and say, you know, this was a faithful servant of God. And I think that's a wonderful description. But Jesus gives us something a little bit more even here, doesn't he? Something that's even better a little bit. He, he kind of notches it up one, and I, and I think it's, it's laudable. To, to be faithful to Christ in your life. But Jesus offers us something a little deeper. He says, I no longer just call you servants. I call you friends. There's this measure of intimacy there. He says, you know, servants don't really know the business of their master. In, in, in the same way, you know, um, if you were... You know, I, I guess working at like a fast food restaurant, you know, at 15 years old or whatever, it's like you don't get to see the books. You don't have to deal with corporate office. You don't have to understand everything that's going on. You just got to flip a few burgers and punch some buttons, right? You're there to do your job. And Jesus says, when you get inducted into friendship with him, it's all of a sudden your involvement in his life and his involvement in your life is deeper and more profound than that. And so calling, he says, you know, calling this relationship one of servants is, is a little too cold for him. He wants to let us in. And so Jesus makes friends with us. So we saw that he initiates it. But then verse 16, he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And this should be familiar words to us. This comes up a number of places in scripture. We could turn 
all kinds of places. Ephesians chapter 1 would be a good place. You know, Paul will echo that for us in saying that God chose us in him before the foundations of the world were laid. We've been chosen by God before we even had a thought about him. But then he goes on and he gives us a reason for why we've been chosen, a reason for why we are friends. Have you ever stopped and thought about that with a, you know, just a, a regular friendship that you have, you know, somebody you know, maybe somebody that uh, you've been friends with forever, you know, and thought about, well, why are we friends? You know, sometimes it's, it's almost startling if you can roll the mental Rolodex back far enough to think, how did we become friends? And think about that first meeting. And sometimes it's, it almost seems as pure chance. Sometimes it, it's like, oh yeah, no, that's totally like that person, but it seemed weird at the time. Um, but you might ask that question, why are, not just why are we friends now, you know, be, you know, thinking about that first instance, but why are we still friends? You know, what's going on in our relationship that we continue to connect with each other? And I loved how you put it, Lynette, you know, that you've seen each other through different stages in life. Because we have a lot of friendships, I think, as we grow and mature and go through different stages of life, friendships sometimes don't last. You know, we're friends for a season. And that's a good thing. That's something we're celebrating. But more rare is those friends that will grow with us, you know, and sort of see us through different trials, different celebrations, different stages of life. So it's helpful to ask, why are we still friends? And, and ask that of your, some of your friendships. That might be something for you to reflect on this week. Why are we still friends? When we ask it of our relationship with Jesus, we, I think we find an interesting answer. Why, Jesus, why are we still friends? And he tells us in verse 16, he says, I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This friendship that Jesus offers us, it sounds a lot like discipleship, following him, um, praying in his name and, and receiving from the Father, bearing fruit. And it's true, it, it, there's, there's some overlap there. And, and even in the language itself, you know, we talked about how in English we have a very broad term of uh, friendship. And, and the word that Jesus uses here can also be translated, not just friend, but someone you love. And so there's, the, you know, there's some blending going on there. And I think that enriches our idea of friendship with Jesus. I don't want to try and tear that apart too much. But especially next week, we're going to talk about a bit about making friendships in your family. It being Father's Day, it seems appropriate. And we're, we are going to maybe dissect our idea of friendship and our idea of love a little bit to see if we can parse that, that out a little bit to get some of the different nuances. But this morning, I want to say that, you know, as we are Jesus' friends, that means he loves us. You know, and, and, and we are his disciples, and it all kind of blends together. And that's something that John loves to do. You know, he'll, he'll paint a beautiful portrait for us, and then, and then it's just, you know, he takes his hand and kind of smudges all the colors together. It's like, you know, it's all connected. It's, it's very circular, and, and you can't pull things apart. And so, and so he says, you know, if we are Jesus' friends, we are also his disciples. And, and, and if we've He's chosen us and, and to be his friends, and we are to go and bear fruit. And so what does this fruit look like? Jesus shows himself to us. He, he meets us, and, and we become his friends, and we bear fruit. Well, that looks like love, good deeds, maturity even. And we'll back the truck up here a little bit as we began um, this morning. Or, or just now in, in verse 9, he says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. So love is one of these fruits that he's looking for, loving other people. And he carries on, he says, I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Here's another fruit for us to bear, the, the, the fruit of joy in our lives. That it's not just this great burden we have to love other people. Sometimes people are not terribly lovable, but Jesus says, if you do this, you will experience profound joy. In, in the sense of, 
you will feel the joy of heaven in your heart. He says, my joy will be in you. But he also says, your joy will complete, be complete. That there's a sense of satisfaction in your life that you cannot get any other way until you love other people. And so Jesus tells us that obedience characterizes Jesus' friends. That if we want to be Jesus' friend, then we have to obey him. And it's not, you know, it's not like our obedience earns his friendship. That's, that's sort of the opposite of gospel. But he s- says instead that, that that's what his friends look like. You know, his friends follow his commands. His friends are his disciples. I remember uh, in grade seven, Maybe it was great. No, it was grade six. Yeah, grade six. I, I realized it was like I was becoming a little bit of a loner in my class, and I wanted to do something about that. And I looked around me, and it was like, well, I wasn't like looking for popularity, but it was like I need, I need to kind of get out of myself a little bit here. And what was the thing that everybody in grade six was doing? And Well, all the guys in my class were playing basketball and baseball. Those were kind of the two, two things. And so for a couple of years, I was big into baseball, actually. Well, and that, that coincided with um, the Blue Jays in the 90, have it, 90s having their two back-to-back world championships. So that was a really good time to like baseball, too, right, as a Canadian. Um, but basketball lasted a bit further, too. But it was like every... Every um, lunch hour, you know, we'd, there was a group of maybe 10 or 15 of us, and we'd, somebody would be playing pickup basketball, uh, and we'd go out and play, and that carried on for, I don't know, two, three years, uh, every lunch hour. And it's like, do you, do, did I have to, be, to play basketball to be these guys' friends? No. I was friends with a few of them beforehand, but it was like, but you looked at the circle, and it was kind of like, are they all friends? Yes. Do they all play basketball? Yes. Like it was, they were connected. It wasn't a requirement, but they kind of, it was kind of circular that way. And that was, that's, I think kind of Jesus point here is he says, when I look at my friends, they follow my commands. They get me because they love one another. Friendship with Jesus is more than obedience, more than simply doing what he says. He says, you know, I, I haven't called you servants. I now call you friends. So it's more than obedience, but it's also not less either. If we think we can be Jesus' friends and not do what he commands, not love each other, then we're sadly mistaken. And John is emphatic on this point, actually. Not so much, well, it comes out in his gospel, but if you want to flip for a second, I'm going to read from uh, for the, the letter of First John, chapter 2. And he does not mince words there. 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 to 11 say this, Anyone who claims to be in the light, but hates a brother or sister, is still in the darkness. If you think you have it figured out, but you are harboring bitterness towards a brother or sister, you haven't figured anything out. Anyone who loves their brother or sister lives in the light, and there's nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. Stark imagery from John to say, if you you cannot love each other, you need to hit the reset button. You need to start over again. You need to, to, to get this figured out. So we sort of emphasized this idea of a friendship this morning. And, and, and Jesus says, if you want to be my friend, you have to love each other. And I want to ask you this week, you know, let's think about it in old and new terms. You know, who, who's someone that you can love this week by doing something that you always do? Because that's part of that faithful picture, right? Is that we keep on doing the acts of love, the things that we need to, to express Jesus' love to one another. And for a lot of us, it's a way of life. And I don't want to discount that. So mark in your mind, who am I loving? Who am I going to love this week in the exact same way that I have loved last week and the week before? You know, for us married folks, we can probably look at our spouse and and list a whole bunch of things quickly that we're going to do this week just like we did the previous week. 
But I want to challenge you as well. There's something old. How about something new? What's something new that you are going to do to show love to one of Jesus' people? To obey Jesus' command in a new way? To love someone, to love each other in a new way? There's a challenge for you. But again, I want to emphasize this is gospel. You know, why are we doing that? Why would we look for a new way to love somebody? Why would we continue in our old way of loving somebody? Is it to earn Jesus' friendship? Jesus, be, if I, I'll be good, please be my friend. That's not the gospel. No. We love because he loved us first. You know, he stepped down from heaven to love us. As, as we've been going through Philippians recently, and that comes up a lot. But I've sort of studiously avoided this verse, and I want to come back to it in the middle of what we read. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. He laid down his life for us. You know, in all of this, this idea of you know me somehow being a better friend to Jesus, me being a better friend to his people, loving people better, it's all... By his example, he, he, was, he did it first. You know, I'm not coming up with anything new in my life. Jesus laid down his life for us. And he says, there's no better way to show your love for somebody. And so he says, you are my friends if you do what I command. That we are inducted into that same sort of love relationship with each other. When we lay it down our lives, we may not be... Well, we're highly unlikely to be nailed to an Italian cross anytime soon, all of us. But we do have the opportunity to die to ourselves each day, to love others in sacrificial and sometimes draining and difficult ways. And yet Jesus calls us to that. This verse, verse 13, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends is, of course, in the gospel of John, looking forward to the cross, that Jesus would lay down his life for his friends, for those that he loves. And so that reminder, I think, fittingly brings us to the communion table this morning, and we're going to celebrate uh, communion together. We've been talking already about being friends with God, and last week, I didn't touch it too much on it this week, but last week we saw how it's about a conversation too. You know, Abraham is considered the friend of God because they talk back and forth. That God discloses himself, but he also listens to Abraham. And communion is sort of that reminder for us. You know, think about that word, communion. To commune with somebody is to communicate. That, that there is back and forth between us. And I want us to take that opportunity this morning. You know, maybe we haven't had much time for conversation with God this week. Maybe it's, a, I don't know about you, maybe it's been a busy week. It was a busy week for me. It was funny, I, I was laying in bed last night, and I had the opportunity to um, kind of reflect on the week, and I just thought, oh, I'm tired. You know, it's been a busy couple days. We've been, in, you know, dealing with some stuff at Tabitha's dad's place. But at the front end, I'd had a two-day retreat. Last Sunday, you know, I kind of finished things up here and wrapped stuff up at home and then went to Camp Nackman for two days. And Camp Nackman? I know, it was awesome, right? No, that's, I was supposed to go there for a van trip, but I didn't go. Oh, that's too bad. I, yeah, I must have taken your spot. Um, but I had a fantastic time there, very restful. And then, but then I'm reflecting by Saturday, it's like, that was a great retreat. And I am dog tired Saturday night, so it's like maybe I need to do that again. Um, but, but just sort of realizing it was like, huh, you know, there's there's a lot there, and and just talking with Jesus about that was good. And sometimes, we, you know, even in the midst of a busy week like that, it's good to pause and and have that time for conversation. And even if this is the only time, you know, during your week, certainly take advantage of it. So we're going to do it a little differently. I haven't passed anything out this morning. I'm going to play a little song uh, for us to take a few minutes to reflect. And then as you're ready, you can just come up and take a a cup and a wafer. And um, 
and sort of celebrate uh, there at the table, and then we'll um, I'll, I'll wrap up in prayer at the end. But I want to um, just give you time to converse with Jesus, to talk to him. Maybe maybe there's some business that needs to be di- done, you know, some confession, um, repentance that needs to take place. Maybe maybe not. Maybe it's just you need to sit and savor the love of your Savior for a moment and, and reflect on his great love for you expressed at the cross. Do that. You know, sometimes talking to Jesus is just about listening. And, and we can be, as we talked about earlier, good listeners in that respect as well. So I'm going to put that on, and you'll have a few minutes. And as you're ready, just feel free to come up. Um, we are we practice what we call open communion at this church. So you don't have to be a member. You don't have to, uh, you know, have your membership card out or anything like that. I think I can express it this way this morning: that if you are Jesus' friend, we welcome you to participate in communion with us.